This is Dr. Lauren Lownan, and this is part two of an online video lecture set intended to introduce you to the microbe Vibrio vulnificus. We talked about what microbes were in part one, and um, this part two will be addressing this area here. And um, what I'm going to talk about now is not necessarily just Vibrio vulnificus, but the genus Vibrio. I'm going to give you an introduction to that. So let's talk about the genus Vibrio. So the genus Vibrio is probably most famous for its type organism, which is Vibrio cholerae, the causative agent of the disease known as cholera, a disease that is currently pandemic globally. It's a very important pathogen, as is Vibrio vulnificus, the focus of our project work, and also a microbe called Vibrio parahemolyticus. These are boxed in red because these are the most well-studied representatives from the genus Vibrio. There are others, they just do not tend to cause disease um, to the same level that Vibrio parahemolyticus, Vibrio vulnificus, and Vibrio cholerae do, and so they are less well-studied. The genus Vibrio includes organisms that are bacterial. They are all gram-negative, which tells you something about their cell wall composition. They have curved rods, shown here. They're almost like little commas. And they are motile, which means they can move because they have flagella, these long structures here. And many of them also have pili, which help out with motility, attachment, and certain other characteristics like being able to inject toxins. They are chemo organo heterotrophic, which means that they get their carbon and their energy from organic molecules. They are facultative anaerobes, which means that they can live growing with oxygen, but they can also use other substances as terminal electron acceptors growing in the absence of oxygen. And they are all typically capable of biofilm formation, which is to attach to one another and grow as a group. All organisms in the genus Vibrio are naturally found in estuarine waters and also many in marine waters. So they like salty conditions. They are halophilic. They live in uh, both free living form and also associated with other organisms, most notably shellfish. Another interesting feature of the genus Vibrio is that unlike most or many prokaryotic cells, they all have two chromosomes. So shown here is a map of the two chromosomes that are found in Vibrio cholerae. And you'll see that it consists of chromosome 1 and chromosome 2. And there are some genetic features annotated or labeled on these chromosomes. For example, ORIC here and here, that's where replication of these chromosomes would begin. And then I want to draw your attention to the fact that these chromosomes are two different sizes. This one's 2.9 mega or million base pairs. This one's 1.1 1 .1 mega or million base pairs. They also contain different genetic content. So for example, chromosome 1 of Vibrio cholerae contains the CTX phage region. That's an area where a phage um, just became permanently part of this genetic feature and it encodes cholera toxin which is one of the virulence factors of Vibrio cholerae and that is not found on chromosome 2 so these are two different chromosomes. The genetic map for chromosome 1 and 2 of Vibrio cholerae has been extensively studied because this is in fact the best studied Vibrio organism um, and it is True that we have mapped um, the two chromosomes for other Vibrio species, but they are not as well studied or well understood. And that's part of the goal of this research project, and that is to construct genetic maps of chromosome 1 and 2 for the Vibrio vulnificus strains that we are working with. So one of the reasons we're interested in Vibrio vulnificus and that people study Vibrio in general is the fact that many of them are pathogenic. So how are people exposed to pathogenic Vibrio? They are exposed by consumption of contaminated seafood, most notably oysters, and they're also exposed by contact with contaminated water or simply contact with that contaminated seafood, like handling oysters or fishing them. So I'm going to mention why oysters matter in this context, and that is because they are filter feeders. 
So when you have microbes that are present in the water around an oyster, those same microbes will concentrate within the oyster because it is a filter feeder. So oysters feed on particles, i.e. algae or phytoplankton, that's found, that are found in the surrounding seawater. They filter water through their gills, and they have a very fine gill structure. So if you filter about 50 gallons of water per day per oyster, that means the oyster is able to accumulate or gather a lot of Vibrio over the course of any given day. And so what we see is if you sample water and you sample oysters nearby, you'll see Vibrio at about 100 times greater concentration in the oysters than you will in the surrounding water. And that's a function of this filter feeding. Filter feeding. So because of that, um, we very closely monitor Vibrio levels, specifically Vibrio cholerae, Vibrio vulnificus, and Vibrio parahemolyticus in oysters. Um, and I'll also point out that people really love to eat oysters raw, um, and that means that they are directly exposed to any pathogens that are found in the oysters because there hasn't been any cooking, there hasn't been any opportunity to inactivate or kill the pathogens. So that represents our introduction to the genus uh, Vibrio, and in the next part of this online lecture series, I'm going to focus in on Vibrio vulnificus specifically.